Our passage for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30, through chapter 13, verse 13. Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. It's the word of God. We are in part five of our series, The Spirit of Love. And um, it's an extraordinary segment of the Bible. It is one of the most incredible things that's ever been said about anything, quite frankly. And, um, and I don't know, I wonder, am I good enough to preach on this subject? But let's try. And today I really want to focus on actually that last verse. It talks about faith, hope, and love. And I want to talk about something that I see in our culture which is deeply troubling, um, which is there isn't hope in our culture. <laughs> That's what I want to talk about today. Of course, we already know there isn't faith in God and Jesus in our culture. But did you know that there are so many people they don't have hope. It's also why they don't have love. They're connected. And that's mostly what I want to talk about today. Okay? Let's get into it. Part one. Cynicism and insecure self-protection lacking hope and faith. That's a mouthful. Cynicism and insecure self-protection. That's our culture right there, okay? Oh, that's our culture. Part two, hope for everlasting friendships, making you more complete. The Bible uses the word perfect. I want to use a slightly different word, which is, I think, the word that the Bible actually means, to make you more complete. Hope for everlasting friendships, making you more complete. And part three, filled by the Holy Spirit, in the body of Christ, okay? Part one, cynicism and insecure self-protection. Let's go to that, that verse, verse 13. Um, if you grew up in the church, I, I hope you know this verse. Um, when I was a kid, it hung on our wall. <laughs> um, it hung on our wall in Korean. <laughs> so I didn't know that that's what it said. And then after a few years of learning some Korean, I said, oh, so that, that's what it says. It's supremely important. It is a very famous um, verse, and justly so. And we actually could do a whole series on just this one verse, faith, hope, and love. If you don't have faith, hope, and love, you, you will die. <laughs> faith, hope, and love is more important 
than your food. <laughs> Jesus says that life is more than what you eat. You know what you need to eat? Faith, hope, and love. <laughs> now, I already started saying our culture doesn't have faith. I, I want to even start right here. I'm not even talking about faith in God. <laughs> First, let's just start here. Faith at its most fundamental place is about what you believe. <laughs> it's about what you believe. You can't exactly prove it, but you believe this to be true about your life, about life, about how things work. There are a lot of things that people believe in our culture today, especially young people, that are horrible. <laughs> They're quite certain these things are true. So um, they have faith in these things. They go, I know this is true. Like, like I, I believe quite certain that there's a God, his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the second person of that Holy Trinity is our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in that. That's faith. Well, they believe certain things about the world that they think is true, which I think is half true at best. And it has great consequences for how they go out into the world and how they, what they expect from the world. And um, so the word that we would use in our culture is, um, is pessimistic. <laughs> the secular word for hope, it's not the exact synonym, but it's kind of as close as that secular people can get, is optimism. <laughs> optimism is not exactly the same thing as hope. Hope is far bigger. Hope is there's something coming which is grand and glorious. Now, if it is built on God, hope is a sure thing. <laughs> it's a sure thing. Um, you know, when secular people use the word, I hope I will meet the love of my life. I hope. I hope we will have such a good marriage, we won't get divorced. I hope. And so you realize that they mean I'm optimistic. <laughs> such a thing might happen. And, it's, and of course, and they use that word hope for something big. But um, I want to just start right here. Do you know that lots of young people today, they don't have that optimism? Do you know that? Um, now faith, hope, and love abide. That means this is what lasts. It, there's no, do you notice in there, uh, going to a great university and making a lot of money and paying off your $2 million house. <laughs> that will abide. <laughs> Do you notice that's not in the list? But if this was the scripture of Silicon Valley, it would be great career achievement, lots of riches, utterly financially secure. That is what will abide, and then our life will be good. But none of that's in the text because none of that is true. <laughs> Faith, hope, and love abide. When I was growing up, secular America, every American thought love is the biggest thing. You know, if you grew up listening to 60 songs, if you grew up listening to the Beatles, love is everything. You know, it's like everything is about love. So everybody just had this kind of sentimental way of talking about it. But somewhere in the last 10 or 15 years, it's kind of going away. I think if a kid who's about 22 years old would listen to some old Beatles song, it's about, everything is about love, they would go, they would use a very bleepity bleep word and say, that's stupid. Because <laughs> they don't believe it. And um, I, I know I'm kind of just talking broadly. I regularly look for essays and articles and research and um, interviews and in smart podcasts by secular people, like our, the brilliant people of our, of our educated um, culture today. And where if something comes up, it's talking about young people and how they're depressed. Young people and how they have, are beset with suicidal ideation. I'm like, oh, oh OK, I, I'm, I'm all about that. And so 
I'll listen to that podcast. I'll read that essay. And, uh, you know, if you've listened to me preach here, you know that I, I ring this bell pretty regularly. So many crazy things come up in this. It's just, it's so, it's, I'm, your pastor, when I'm not even preparing a sermon, I'm just trying to prepare to be a godly man who loves you and prepares our church and leads our church into this dark city. I, I, I regularly listen to this stuff, read these things, and on a pretty regular basis, like almost every week, almost every week, some statistic or something will come up which I find flabbergasting. And this has happened to me so often, it's like, well, weren't you shocked enough last week? Weren't you shocked enough the week before that and the week before that? And it just keeps happening. I can't really believe that 25% of young people have suicidal ideation. It's actually that number. I'm just throwing that number out there. It's actually, I think it's actually a worse number. How can that be? I'll just throw something out. I was listening to a, a podcast about the state of young men today. And they threw out some crazy statistic. Uh, like 5,000 guys were surveyed for this. And some ridiculous number, 30%? 30% in the last two weeks have talked to zero people. <laughs> They've had zero conversations with human beings outside of their house. When I heard that statistic, I gasped. Those guys who are doing that, they will soon, if not, they're already there. They have the devil in their head saying, maybe you should kill yourself because nobody, it doesn't matter if you're still around. <laughs> That's happening in our culture. I read an essay about guys who are giving up dating. They give up dating. And so this is something I learned. Now, so I am so old, OK? In our church, I'm X generation. X generation is like the oldest group in this church. There's some people of you who are a little older than X gen today. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> okay. But the oldest crowd in this church on a regular basis is X generation. These are the geezers in the church. X generation, I cannot understand why a young man cannot ask a, a young woman out. But in this essay, they explained it to me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so that's what's going on, which is dating happens through this thing. OK? So this device, which you all have, came out in 2006, or at least the version that we know, called the smartphone, which should be called from the devil's make you horribly depressed phone. <laughs> so here's how it works. What they say is, if you try, if you go up to a girl in person, this is what the pessimistic guys say anyway, the ones who have no hope, say if you go up to a girl and ask her, for, let's say she's, she's good looking, she's at the coffee shop you're at, and you strike up a conversation with her, and you get up the guts to say, can I buy you a cup of coffee and sit down. That's how X-Gen did it. That's how the geezers did it, by the way. OK? It works. So all you young people, it worked back then. It's possible. It could work for you. But this is what the, those who are pessimistic think. The young men who are pessimistic saying, when I get on the phone, since I'm only five foot six and don't make $200,000 and didn't go to some fancy university, the women on the phone say no. And if I go and ask her out in person, she'll think I'm creepy. So how will I ever meet a girl who will even remotely like me? <laughs> and then they start to think that. They believe that. They put their faith that that is the truth. And then if that's what you believe, your faith, then guess where hope goes? Out the window. <laughs> and when there is no hope to meet a pretty woman that you could sacrifice your life for, you start going into a dark place. Some get depressed. Some get cynical. Cynicism is like this. 
I'm not cynical, pastor. This, I, this is the way people say it to me. I'm not cynical, pastor. I'm realistic. I'm realistic. <laughs> realistic. Okay. So you see the dark half of reality, and now you've accepted that's reality. <laughs> and because you put up this crust of like, I just see it. I know what's real. And we put that up there. You know why? Because if you have hope that maybe it won't be that way, and then you're disappointed, it'll hurt. <laughs> Cynicism is self-protection. <laughs> That's what it is. You never thought of it that way? <laughs> Cynicism is cursing yourself. If you think the world is only dark and good things cannot happen to you, such as love can't come into your life. Remember, I'm not talking about God here. <laughs> I'm talking about meeting some nice boy or nice girl. Or how about just making some friends? Because some of these guys, they don't even go out and try to make a friend. And a lot of young people today, this is the way they talk to their friends. You know why this is the way we interact with our friends? Because it feels safe. You don't have to show up. Nobody looks at your face. Nobody can say you're not good looking enough or smart enough or interesting enough or funny enough. If you show up in person and you try and you want to try to be friends and they're not interested in you, and this is probably what they're doing. This is how they show you, I'm not interested in you. It hurts. Mm. So then, we do it too. And let me tell you something. I never thought of this verse this way until meditating on these sermons. Do you notice that this is not face to face? <laughs> this most glorious word from God we only know in part, but when love is full and true and complete and perfect, we'll be face to face. Love seeks face to face. <laughs> this is absolutely not face to face. It's exactly the opposite. This is death. <laughs> Revive church, let's put this down. <laughs> Let's seek face to face. And not just inside of a, when we hang out with each other. Let's go out. Let's give our face, which is to give our heart. The face is the entryway into a person's heart. The face reveals what's in the heart. We're so afraid of each other. We're so afraid that if I try and get rejected, it'll hurt. But all loving puts you in a place where you're vulnerable and it'll hurt if you're rejected. There is no other kind of loving. <laughs> That's the only kind there is. Now let me give you a, a very important quote from a very wise man, much wiser than me. And then we'll get to part two. This is C.S. Lewis from a very, very incredible book called The Four Loves, and this way he puts it. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. We're, we're, we're afraid to even just show up and put our phone down and strike up a conversation, and we're so cynical or pessimistic, or let me give you a different word, hopeless that you'll make a friend, that they'll just be kind. But if you don't want any friends, this is a good way to go. <laughs> but if you do want friends, you have to put yourself out there. <laughs> if you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one, <laughs> not even an animal. Wrap 
it your heart carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. The 21st century coffin looks a lot like this. It's got like four little parts. It's got a colorful case. And you don't need wood to get into that coffin. You just pull it out and go like this. And now your heart will be safe. Nobody will reject you. You don't have to be bored. Hey, I don't ever have to be bored. YouTube, what's on YouTube? Oh, what's on TikTok? He goes on. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, your heart will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, that is the tragedy of getting your heart hurt, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. That's a word we don't use too much. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations. Perturbations is an old word meaning someone bothers you. <laughs> from all the dangers and bothers of love is hell. Hmm. Revive church. Don't live in a coffin that will take you into hell. Let's live in Christ. <laughs> and we drink of the Spirit. And give each other love. And risk being hurt. And let the Lord bind us up. And love again. Let's go to part two. Hope for everlasting friendships making you more complete. I want to take you to verse 8. Love never ends. Revive, do you believe that? Do you really believe that? In Silicon Valley, we do not believe that. <laughs> we absolutely do not believe that. <laughs> In Silicon Valley, we believe love ends. I'll go out this girl, and if she can't stand me anymore, then I guess it'll end. I'll marry her, and um, if I get really tired of her after a certain number of years, I guess it'll end. <laughs> That's what we believe. <laughs> but God says love never ends. Can you have hope for that? As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. These are the great gifts of the Corinthian church that were so, they thought they were so amazing. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Prophecy is to give the words of God. We talk about even the knowledge and wisdom of God in part. We only know part of it. But when the perfect comes... Now, the Greek, perfect doesn't mean everything is so pristine, it, will, it can never be broken. The Greek concept of perfect could mean that, but I don't think that's the biblical concept here. Perfect means something is in part, and it's changing until it's complete, until it's whole. Or, as I taught you last week, it's filled with shalom. You are flourishing. But when the completion comes, the partial will pass away. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So here's what I want to say to you today. If you believe in your cynicism and your partial knowledge, you have only a partial knowledge of how women might react to you. If you're a single man and you're hoping to meet the love of your wife, life, okay? Or let's just say you're a lone, just a lonely woman and you're like, I don't have enough friends. 
I don't know how to make friends, but nobody will be my friend because every time I tried to be a friend, they just put up their phone, <laughs> OK? Or the only way I could talk to them is through this way. And I get really lonely. That's partial knowledge. What I want to ask of you today is have hope. <laughs> and not based on your knowledge, not based on what you believe. Will you dare to believe in the Bible? That there's a God who loves you. <laughs> and that he might offer you a friendship. And that friendship might be a really great and beautiful friendship. And that friendship, will receive, you will receive a love. You'll receive a love so wonderful, you didn't actually knew that you could ever have a friend like that. I'm not even talking about Jesus. <laughs> I'm just talking about a friend. A friend that'll change your life. A friend that'll make you so happy. A friend that'll make you laugh. A friend that'll understand you when you hurt. A friend that'll put ideas and see things in you you never saw in yourself, such that after you have this friend, sometime in the future, you will change. And even what you think about yourself, which is only in part, you only know in part. But when you receive more love, an important friend, then even what you think about yourself, which is partial, will start to grow more complete. And when it becomes more complete, that hope, this, you, it started with hope, but real love is starting to come in and making you more complete. It changes how you think. It changes your dreams. It changes your ambitions. It changes your plans. It, even, it just changes what you think about yourself. Can you have hope for that? When I was young, secular, godless people, that was normal. Most of them did have hope for that. Not every single person, but most of them. And they didn't even believe in God. Today, a horrible percentage of young people, they don't even have that. And I'll bet you some of you are sitting in this room today who are watching it on YouTube. I want to tell you a story of a friend who changed my life. OK? Um, friendship, love, is so important. <laughs> that if you don't have it, you will want to die. <laughs> the devil will start saying things to you that you will start to believe. And there will be no other voice that can counteract that horrible voice. And the devil will speak that, those things to you through you. The devil will make you have faith in your partial, cynical views and will throw hope out the window. And then you won't have love. And then you'll probably die. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be like that. I beg you today, just it so can change. And it might, be, it might start really small and strange. So let me tell you a personal story. When I was 22 years old, I graduated from college. And I went to graduate school on the other side of the country. And uh, I went to college nearby here. And uh, the, the campus culture was totally different from my house. And so it felt like I was 1,000 miles away. But when I needed my mom's company, <laughs> and I wanted to eat my mom's food, I would just call her because there was no texting back then, by the way. I'd have to call her, and she'd actually have to pick up. I'd call her and say, Mom, can I come home and eat dinner with you? <laughs> and she'd go, of course. And I would throw my dirty laundry in the back seat, and she would do the laundry. <laughs> and I'd have love. But now, I was going... 3,000 miles away, so um, I hope nobody thinks this is a boast. I went to a school called Harvard Divinity School. Some of you know this. Now, let me tell you something that most of you don't know. Harvard Divinity School is one of the most horrible, evil schools in the whole world. Did you know that? Did you know that? It's called Divinity School. 
It started as a Christian school. It's the oldest part of Harvard. Harvard started to train pastors, and it had Puritan theology, which is excellent theology. So that's the way it started. That is not how it is today, and is not the way it was in 1993 when I went there. When I went there, they taught you everything that was the opposite of the Bible. <laughs> everything, and just crazy things, crazy stuff. So, now I knew it was kind of like that, but I wasn't going to be a pastor, and I liked the study of theology and philosophy, so I was like, well, I already went to college, and they always told me everything against the Bible anyway, so what's the difference? <laughs> okay, so I'll go to this place, and it'll be the difference. But if you believe the Bible is the infallible word of God, and that Jesus is the atoning lamb of God, and that Christianity is the only way to salvation, you're considered the worst, most stupid person at Harvard, <laughs> at least when I was there. And there's a handful of us strange people who were there. And it was a pretty lonely place. <laughs> so intellectually, I'm being bombarded from brilliant people and attacked at the center of my identity and my hope in Jesus. And the people in class are angry and hateful. Today, we would use the word cancel. Oh, they absolutely would have canceled you in class. <laughs> so you guys kind of now know what it's like now. A lot of you are, are, are fearful of being canceled or fired. That's exactly how I felt in class every day. Okay, every day. And um, in my dorm, I bumped into a guy while brushing my teeth. Brushing my teeth. Brushing my teeth. I'm a 22-year-old Korean American Christian from the West Coast. And I'm brushing my teeth, and this dude comes in. He's bald. He's about 30 years old. He's brushing his teeth. And uh, he had a different face than most other people at Harvard Divinity School. You know what his face was like? He had joy. <laughs> Weird. Most other people at Harvard Divinity School were angry, quick to judge, quick to tell you your vocabulary, your words, your thinking were bad and bigoted, hateful, racist, homophobic. All those words, OK? Boom, boom, boom. They were just like, it's like racist, racist, homophobic, homophobic. <laughs> just canceled. Now let's cancel you, OK? That's, that was school every day for me. So here's this good old boy. He was white. He was from Oklahoma. And I introduce myself. And this is the language that you use at Harvard Divinity School. My name is, what is your tradition? Because you don't just say I'm a Christian, because almost nobody is. And he said, I'm evangelical. And I was like, huh, huh, huh? Isn't that like, didn't you just come out of the closet and just tell me that you believe in Jesus? That was really weird. And he was confident. And he didn't mind. And so we struck up a friendship. And the following year, we became roommates. We moved out of the dorm. We lived in an apartment. And his name is Scott Kyle. Scott was 30 when I was 22. I think he's 30, 22. I think that sounds about right. And some of you know that I am a kind of like wide-ranging, restless intellectual. I'm curious about everything. If you ever hang out with me, you know, I might start to explain to you some weird piece of philosophy from the 17th century, <laughs> or I'll give you a little piece of like cultural analysis of some commercial I just watched, right? And uh, because that's fun for me. Scott's just like that. <laughs> he's not quite as talkative as me, but he's smarter. And he knows more. And so when I talk to this guy, Scott, it was incredible. <laughs> I never met anybody quite like that before. It was like, it was like a 30-year-old oaky version of me, <laughs> but, but uh, funnier, <laughs> funnier, and smarter, and humbler. Okay. And that friendship struck up while brushing my teeth in the bathroom of a dorm. 
Scott and I would watch like James Bond, which is like, you should, you're supposed to be canceled for watching James Bond today. It's too sexist, okay? But we watch James Bond, and Scott would make a point about how the men dressed back in the 60s and how it was manly. And we would get into a discussion about 60s manliness. And off and running, this is what Scott was like. He deepened my theology. He deepened my worldview. He changed my political philosophy. He taught me how to talk to people who had worldviews who hated Christianity. He regularly just struck up conversations with people who hated the fact that he was a cisgender, <laughs> heterosexual, white male Christian. Oh, he was a Republican. They hated that about him. And he just talked to all these people who hated him. And he talked to them with joy and love and gladness. Isn't that an interesting, strange guy? I learned all that from him. <laughs> so I got this friend who wasn't just a friend. He, wasn't, he was a brother. He was an older brother, which I n never knew I even needed. I got an older brother. I never had, didn't even know I needed. And if you come to heaven one day and you don't see me around, Scott and I will be hanging out over there having a couple beers, talking about some philosophy thing and having a lot of laughs because that's an everlasting friendship. <laughs> if you get Jesus, you don't only get the love of God through Jesus. You get the love of friends. You get hope of friendships. Friendships that will never end. Friendships that will never end even when you're bad. <laughs> even when you move away and you never call them. Scott and I talk only a handful of times a year. And then like, and then we just, we, just get, we just ease right into it. We just start laughing and making jokes. He starts making these really, he make, they're kind of corny, and they're really super smart, and it's all strange all at the same time. God might give you a friend like that. But you know where it starts? Get out of the coffin, give him your face, and it starts with hope. And if you have that hope grounded in Christ, the friendship will come from God. Okay? Now let's close. That wasn't the gospel. That was just wisdom. <laughs> I just gave you wisdom. If you're inside your cynicism, you are not in wisdom. <laughs> okay? You're in a very black foolishness coming from probably yourself which isn't really even yourself. It's coming from the devil. I just gave you wisdom. Suicide's not so smart. It's just, I just gave you an application out of the scriptures. This passage, it doesn't exactly say so, but if you know it from the context that I've been preaching to you, it's about the Holy Spirit. It's about the gifts of the Spirit, but this is the gift of the Spirit which is more excellent than the gifts, than the gifts. We're going to talk about the gifts in this series. I know we're like, we're about five sermons in, so hasn't talked about the gifts yet. We'll get there. But I want to end with how you think about the church and the Holy Spirit. So, part three, filled by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. And let's go to the verse that by now, I hope this is really in you, Okay. Chapter 12, verse 12. This is the context, remember. For just as the body is one and has many members. The body is, we're talking about the body of Christ. And here he's talking about the church. And all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. I told you earlier in our, in our service, we said we don't, we drain the religion out of this. So if you think there was a day you got baptized, you did that religion, now you're a Christian. Okay, let me tell you, that's, that's a really bad way of thinking. 
That is a symbolic representation of a deeper thing that happened inside of you. Baptism means immersion. You have been immersed into the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is the church. You have been immersed into the church in one spirit. That's what this passage is saying. All Christians, and I'm going to say this in quotes, who say, I'm good with Jesus, but I hate the church. I don't need church. Those people are truly foolish. They disagree with the Bible. They pretty much despise the Bible. They don't understand this passage. The truth is, you have been, if you accept Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and receive that by his blood all your sins are washed away and now you can be loved by God forever, you are immersed into the church forever through the Spirit. So, goes on to say, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. Let me say it differently in our church. Korean or not Korean? Asian or not Asian? Rich or poor? <laughs> Super, you know, whatever great degree you have or you have no degree. It doesn't matter. All have been made to drink of one spirit. So, this whole context is about your gifts. And then at the end of this chapter, which we, or you keep reading every single week, let me show you a more excellent way. You should desire the, good, you know, the higher gifts, but let me show you a more excellent way, a more surpassing way, a greater way. And then he talks about love. When you drink from the Holy Spirit, when you drink from the Holy Spirit, how do you know if the Holy Spirit is in you? How do you know if the Holy Spirit is coming into you and reshaping you? You will start to, it starts with what you believe. If you say, church, they're just going to let me down. It's just institutional religion. They're just the same as the world. You know, they're full of BS. They're just trying to get my money and use me. Because I'm sure nobody in this room has ever thought that, right? <laughs> if that's what you believe, it's not from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's from the devil. It's from very dirty, worldly, unclean spirit. It's coming out of here. It's coming on the TV. It's in the books. You learned it in your university. The smart people told you this, the so-called smart people. That's not of the spirit. But maybe while you're being cynical, this little voice goes off in your head, but maybe there's Jesus. Maybe God actually loves me through Jesus. Maybe some people at church actually believe in Jesus. Maybe those people actually follow Jesus. Maybe those people might actually love me. If you put your faith there, that's from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then, if you go from this empty, dark hole that we call our soul, that we're constantly trying to fill up with money and, and achievements and all kinds of other things that will not satisfy, and, but then you think, maybe if I put the coffin down, <laughs> and have hope that God will bring me a friend. Maybe if I try to be a friend, even if they hurt me, then I'll experience something of the love of God. If that happens inside of you, you have drank from the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, Sometimes you ask for a really good job and you want more money because, you know, everybody in the city wants more money, <laughs> okay? If you're not asking for more money, you're, you're like, you know, you're in that 0.1%, <laughs> okay, maybe the 1%. And then Jesus goes, no, right? 
because Jesus wants to give you more love. He wants to give you a friend that will be forever. And you know where there's a good chance you're going to find that friend? In the body of Christ. <laughs> the place where you have been baptized into. Because you know what is the society of heaven? It's the church. You know how I found my friend Scott? I was just looking for somebody else who knew Jesus. I was in the blackest, darkest place from hell. And in the bathroom of the darkest, blackest place from hell, I met somebody who has the spirit, who has faith, and who has hope, and he can give love. And I knew he was from God. <laughs> and boy, was he from God. So revive church. Put your hope in Christ. Put your cynicism away. Put down your coffins. In this church, let us brim with the faith, hope, and love that we have drank of the Spirit. And whenever anybody comes into this church or whenever they meet us on the Bishop Elementary campus or whenever, whenever you go meet them while you're sitting and having coffee at the coffee shop or while, however it is that you meet them, give them your face. Give them your heart. And they too might think, this person's strange. How come this person's not in their phone? How come this person's not angry? How come this person's not lonely? How come this person has joy? Just like how I thought about my friend. <laughs> and then they might open their heart up. And on that moment, you may end up getting a friend that you never thought you'd get. One of the best friends you ever got. That's how it could happen from God. Let's pray.